It's the 20th EY Entrepreneur of the Year, the awards show that takes a bird's eye view on the best of business success across the island. From coast to coast, representing every corner of the country, 24 pioneers of industry and endeavor have been chosen. Tonight, five more nominees. Our whole point is that we will constantly come up with new ideas. The big thing is, don't panic. We can get to anything. Going looking for funding during a recession was probably one of the first signs of madness. I was brought up with buses around the place and I think I was age 10 or 11 when I started driving. <laughs> there was a hunger there, all right. My only regret is that I didn't start my own business earlier. Much as you gotta you know, stick to what you're good at on the one hand, you need a certain amount of restlessness to explore new areas and, and new markets. 24 are chosen, and in two weeks' time, the finalists will gather at the annual awards to crown the EY Entrepreneur of the Year 2017. From the spectacular to the extraordinary, Cogs and Marvel deliver every time. The event management company, founded by Jane Gallagher and Roisin Callaghan in Dublin, has just opened an office in San Francisco to build on their runaway success with tech sector clients back home. When we set it up out here, we thought, you know, it'll grow, it'll grow. It's just ballooned. It's phenomenal the amount of business that there is here and our challenge now is to grow the team out here which we envisage in the next 18 months is going to be bigger than the Dublin office. A lot of Americans think that it's complex working in Europe and it really isn't and we just want to take that headache away. We'll deal with them on the same time zone, we'll deal with them in dollars, we understand the geography. It's not difficult for us and I think for them to be able to have a partner that understands Europe so well for them is, is a, a massive plus. Cogs and Marvel create events with budgets from 20,000 to 5 million euro. And with Dublin such an important hub for the world's largest tech companies, they frequently find themselves at the business end of some pretty big projects with some pretty big logistical challenges. So we're in the RDS at the moment and we're organising an event for one of our clients and we're using multiple halls in the space and we're prepping the room for about three or four days before the event actually happens and they're going, we're building it literally from, as you see it now, to multiple different spaces that are all themed differently. Yeah, so this yeah. is the drawing for this room. Yeah. So this is the door that's behind us. Yeah. And then this will be the main stage down here. So essentially this here is what our set's going to look like. Because the room's based around space and space movies and all that kind of thing, um, it's going to look like you're on the bridge of a spaceship. Great. Wow. Our whole point is that we will constantly come up with new ideas. So we started off this project two years ago where we had a whole theme and a whole idea that we took to the then client and sold to the client. And it was great, yes, we're in. Six months ago. Actually, do you know what? That was done last year at something else, so we had to go back to the drawing board, come up with new themes. The big thing is, don't panic. It'll be okay. We can get to anything. We have a brilliant team. We are going to do a princess karaoke booth where the only thing you can sing is princess songs from Disney movies. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> brilliant. Right. I love it. Yeah. So You'll then, be in there. Won't you? Yeah. Let it go. <laughs> <laughs> is that, does that... Cogs and Marvel provide the creative idea, practical project management and logistical backup with a dedicated travel department in-house. To stay ahead of the ambitions of their clients, the payroll has grown to more than 50 people. Three years ago, we had six people working in the company. There was myself and Roshan and we had four others. And we actually realised that we didn't have the skill set to actually grow a company. We could continue growing with our existing client base, but we wanted to grow into different markets, different clients and different types of events. We thought nothing could be done without us, which is, you know, a fatal flaw in any business. And it took us a long time to realise that, of course, we can expand the company and bring in really good people and people that are better than us. Instead of just growing out, we wanted to grow up. You know, we have a board, we have a group CEO that we report into. You know, that in itself was... We have a boss. Uh, we have a boss, mm -hmm. you know, that we didn't have before. We always would bounce things off each other, but we have a boss, we have a chairman, and, you know, we it's making us answerable, which is, yeah. which is great. Of 
course, the boss that matters most is the group of delegates who will descend on the RDS in 24 hours. Months of work are about to come to fruition. It's an adrenaline rush, a lot of it is, because you're literally, you'll do three days with two hours sleep, you know, because you have to be there to see everything. And then it's over. It's a lovely feeling at yeah. the end of an event to go, wow, look what we did. Yeah. You know, and, and it's, and you know, that used to be you and me, yeah. but now it's a whole team. Jeannie Mac, look what the whole team has done. It's amazing. Brightspark Ian McKenna is turning energy savings into a thriving business. E-Light replaces less efficient light fittings with energy saving ones. The money saved more than pays for the upgrade. So we come into your business, we establish what type of lighting you have, what type of energy savings can be generated, and then we install energy efficient lighting and the energy savings generated completely covers the cost. It's a concept. We're establishing that your inefficient lighting can generate a lot of energy savings. Those energy savings are worth money. All we're really doing is making the energy savings pay for the product. This room would be operational, say, 12 hours a day. Over a year, it would cost around 210 euro for the energy to operate these lights. After we've done the switch, this will cost less than 21 euro for the whole year. It's 90% more efficient. From the convention centre to the Point Village, keeping the lights burning brightly has never been more economical and the biggest savings are to be made in the commercial arena. Last year, Elite installed 150,000 individual products, each one guaranteed and maintained for three years. The company invests up front so that 100% of the savings goes to the client. In essence, this would be a typical good commercial project. The time the light is on is 24 hours. Eli came in here and changed all the lighting in the Point Village here in Dublin. There's four storeys underground car park and overnight their energy costs were reduced by between 65 and 70 percent. Oh, there's real genuine savings. In 2016, projects that Eli completed will generate over 15 million in energy savings for those clients. That the energy savings benefit the environment is an added bonus for Ian, who took the leap into business when others were battening down the hatches. Going looking for funding during a recession was probably one of the first signs of madness. Um, but we persisted. We're coming through, coming out the other side. And at the same time, we've managed to keep our funding within Ireland, which is something we're quite proud of. Energy efficiency is a big topic for many, many reasons. Cost being one, everything to do with energy is going up in price. It's a perfect opportunity for us. Ian was among the first off the blocks to provide light as a service in Ireland. Going deeper with that investment means his gaze is always skyward. Not at the stars, but at the light fittings. I swim as often as possible. Mostly mornings before work or any time I can grab. It's a great way to be alone. To use your brain and no phones, no interruptions, nobody talking to you. So it's solitude, yeah. It's my time. I would not like to have regrets. I have a nice touch of amnesia, so I can forget. Um, that is amnesia, isn't it? Yeah. I have a nice touch of amnesia that I can forget the bad things and get on with the good things. <laughs> with scheduled services from the City of the Tribes to Dublin Airport, Jim Burke's GoBus.ie is sucking diesel all along the M6. It's no surprise that Jim was the first to spot the lucrative gap in the market in 2009 because the bus business is in Jim's blood. I was brought up as a child with buses around the place. My dad always had buses as long as I can remember. And I think I was age 10 or 11 when I started driving. <laughs> so, and yeah, I think about 11 I can remember driving a minibus. And then as soon as I became of age to get a driving license, we uh, didn't have a car and I went to do the test in the minibus at a, a young 17-year-old and, uh, of course, they took probably exception to it and that uh, it took me three times to get the, the licence. Eventually, I had to do it in the car. Jim had better luck in business. Before GoBus, he started an intercity bus service in 1994, which he sold to a multinational competitor less than 10 years later. In common with many entrepreneurs, when he was starting out, he got plenty of advice. 
The advice I got when I was intending to set up my own was to not do it, that it was a very tough game to be in uh, on your own and uh, not to go down that road. And that came from my parents. Uh, I suppose my mentor at the time would have been my dad, but at the same time, before he passed away in 2004, he was delighted to see that we had made a success of our business. Not content with sitting at home, Jim got back into the business driving seat again with GoBus.ie in 2009, a non-stop service between the West and the capital. When it's busy, very occasionally I'd, I'd drive the coach. Like, uh, do you have a match like last weekend where Galway were playing Tipperary in Dublin and uh, all hands on deck, we all had to drive that day. So I still enjoy the odd occasion behind the wheel and long may it last. I would never ask anybody to do anything if I hadn't done it myself beforehand. So it's, it's important that they know that I can do it. It's vital, I think, yeah. With a new HQ and a line of succession, retirement is on the horizon for Jim. While he has many loyal staff who have travelled the road with him, he's content now to leave the navigating to the next generation, among them, son Dara. We've always been our own buses. They've always been um, part of our lives, so even from, since we were small. And, uh, eventually fell into the role of transport manager. So I started off driving and then took over the transport manager role. Driving buses before we're driving cars, nearly. Now that the two boys are in the business, it's much easier on me. I'm delighted to have them involved in the business. Very different now compared to what it used to be when I was on my own. I relax more, I don't worry about things. I sleep well at night time. My days used to be 15 or 18 hour days. At that stage, everything was done around the kitchen table. Now, there's no business run from home. Everything is run from here. We're barred from speaking about business and at the Sunday dinner. We're not allowed to do it anymore. Over 20 years of the EY Entrepreneur of the Year Awards, entrepreneurship has evolved. A new battalion of business leaders has emerged, inspired by past innovators and willing to do battle on their own terms. We watched Entrepreneur of the Year every year. It was taped and we watched it and it was definitely part of the annual viewing. We would always have watched it and come away thinking, oh God, we could do that one day. I think the opportunity arose and it just seemed like the right thing to do. Um, it was a huge opportunity to work slightly differently, to work with my husband, to try something new. So we just said, let's do it. Around the same time that Gillian Maxwell was considering leaving a much-loved permanent post in Trinity College to join forces with her husband in their own venture, Paul Quigley flew home from New York, leaving a successful law career to start Newswhip. The ambition of entrepreneurship is no longer seen as such a risky business. Well, at the time of the financial crisis, there's macro and micro trends, right? So it's bad overall, but what was good, meanwhile there was micro trends like the internet is growing fast. A lot of people are migrating online to read news. There's some interesting trends. The social networks are suddenly growing quickly at that time. So if you're zeroing into a business in that segment of the economy, it's still a good time. And I really didn't see any more safety in staying in a big firm that might go out of business versus starting my own thing. As long as there's a market need and something you can satisfy, why not go and do it? I think that there was a time when if somebody said you're an entrepreneur, you'd be kind of the eyes would go up to heaven, all right. Um, no, I think it has changed. I think that there's more of an acceptance now of, of, um, of you know, people that want to go it alone and build something. And I think people are far more kind of encouraging of people that want to run with that. But I think the actual DNA that makes up an entrepreneur is probably the same. Some characteristics of the entrepreneur have certainly remained the same over the last number of years. The risk takers, certainly very ambitious self-starters, but there have been some changes, I would say definitely added resilience. We definitely have more women in the programme now. 20 years ago we had no female finalists in our programme and this year we have a phenomenal eight finalists, which is, I think, really reflective of the impact that women are making on business in Ireland and globally. I think there is a younger generation coming through who have travelled more, they've seen opportunities around the world. There is a greater emphasis on entrepreneurs generally than there was maybe 20 years ago. There are more success stories out there that people can see. So I think we should be optimistic, but not complacent. 
believe every journey is unique, what traits then do these modern pioneers share? I think one of the good things about entrepreneurship is there's a lot of different types, but that's one thing I've, I've learned through Entrepreneur of the Year is meeting all the different entrepreneurs. How do you get your grit right? That's probably the most important thing, because you've got to have it, but you can't just be jumping up and expecting the same thing to work if it, today if it failed yesterday. I think there's always going to be people who would run away from entrepreneurship, and then there's always going to be people who are attracted to it. I think we always, as entrepreneurs, have to do a job of promoting it and um, encouraging those people who are a little bit afraid to take that jump. Gary and Andrew Irwin are the third generation to lead Bedec, a leading designer and supplier of bed and bath linen. Founded in 1951 by their grandfather, Bedeck grew from the fertile soils of the Lagan Valley linen tradition. This is just absolute classic uh, Irish linen handkerchief. That's exactly what we used to make. Exactly what we made. At one stage, was, we had 250 people making them, would you believe? So we would have made, made these on site, stitched, stitched by hand, um, going back in the 50s and 60s. And then, of course, the, the paper handkerchief arrived on the scene and uh, sorted that out. <laughs> kind of put, put pen to that. <laughs> The tide turned on the linen industry and Bedeck refocused into design and distribution. Gary and Andrew were on duty when the factory closed. When we made the decision to move offshore, it was a very difficult thing to do. There was a long history of manufacturing product. There were a lot of people here who had worked with our grandfather and, and obviously our father. And to have to stand in front of them and tell them that we could no longer do that was it was very difficult, but we knew it was something that was necessary to take the business forward. We were making 20,000 units a week, thinking we were a sizable factory, and the first factories we visited in Turkey were making a quarter of a million units a day. So you suddenly realised you're in the wrong game. How many metres a day would you be able to produce? A napkin 22 inches square would take about six hours by hand there to produce. Go. And that's when things are going really well and you don't have any warp threads breaking. Because yeah. when you have to stop your time. And on the air jet machines today, that's into thousands now, isn't it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Be an expensive handkerchief. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> today, Bedeck employ 370, designing and supplying 14 brands of linens across the UK, Ireland, and now the USA. Following the move from manufacture to design and wholesale, the Irwins invested in a 100,000 square foot office and warehouse complex, signalling a new lease of life for the business and for Dad Gordon. The set of plans for the offices were about 20 years ago and I was showing him it and I said, listen, there's your office there, will that be all right? And he said, don't need one. <laughs> <laughs> that was kind of the... You uh, couldn't build me a golf course. <laughs> that, was a, that was the strategic uh, uh, moving offside. So well, it's... it's 16, 18 years ago now, so... I yeah. still would pop in, just occasionally, just to see what's going on. I'm very proud of them. Indeed, they've done a wonderful job. I'm a very lucky man. In 1988, Bedeck's turnover was around £1 million sterling. Today, the company is pulling in about £40 million. If history has taught the brothers anything, it's that survival is guaranteed only through constant innovation. Bedeck launches in New York for the first time which has been a partnership with a US company, which will see us bring DKMY bed and bath into this market. And it's going to be relationships and situations like that that will take us forward. We're trying to be progressive and, and try and not be afraid. Much as you've got to you know, stick to what you're good at on the one hand and build on that equally, you need a certain amount of restlessness to, to explore new areas and, and new markets. Revive Active is an innovative health supplement company causing a big stir. From its Galway home, Revive has its sights set on boosting energy levels globally, all for the price of a cup of coffee a day. Where we were up there, the 14 tee box, you can look across at the Clare Hills, you can see Galway Bay coming in, you can see as far as Arran, Inishmore, and of course, if you go further field there, you're, into, you're heading towards Boston, which we have our eye on for next year. The American market is absolutely huge, it's staggering. It's $24.5 billion. We're looking at just a piece, we're looking at Florida, which is a population of 20 million. You know, it's staggering. And we think our products are a perfect match for the American market. We're a global company, but our home market is very much uh, our core market. 
Despite a roundabout route to running his own business, first in banking and then financial services, Dahi has found his groove with Revive. There was a hunger there, all right, and my only regret is that I didn't start uh, my own business earlier. Revive activists for everybody. You look at the, how fast our lives have become, the stress that we're under. We're a health solution. We are a supplement which gives you everything and you feel the benefits. That's why people keep coming back. We took a decision straight away that we would go directly to our retailers and our retailers are our partners. We have a thousand retailers on the island of Ireland and we work very closely with our customers too, through our retailers. You know, our new branding is in since January now. How are the customers reacting to it? Um, great. I think it has a bit more obvious of what the, pro the benefits of it on the front here. It was difficult to raise money. We started in the middle of the recession. There were negative things coming out on radio and TV. So we were sort of green shoots and uh, a number of people backed us. Cash flow was a huge issue and I had to go fundraising at one stage, you know, so friends gave money and I trawled the local accountants and one local accountant, he put me in touch with a retired priest and I remember going out to this, this man and he, he gave me 25 grand over two years on a bullet payment and I came back to the office and I said, y you can lodge that check into the current account and also I've got somebody praying for us. <laughs> so. Dahi sees himself very much as part of the community, a community that is increasingly health conscious. Well, the heart is very much in Galway. My kids here in Galway, my wife is Galway. It's a great city to live in. I walk with my daughter, Serica, so we have a loop that we can do around the house for about 40 minutes. Or the prom here goes from Black Rock down to Nemo's Pier, which is about an hour. And today, it's easier going down than going back. We get emails from people, we have Facebook and Twitter posts, unsolicited, of benefits that people are experiencing, and that's extremely gratifying. So if you're saying, you know, what's your legacy? Well, I helped so many people. Um, that's good for me. Next week, the final five nominees. A world beater on the West Coast, making medicine easier to swallow, born to run a software business taking on the telecoms world and engineered for global success.